These are some of Animalogic's spookiest creatures, from vampires to underground terrors to deep sea ghosts and undertakers of the savannah. This is Animalogic's Halloween Spooktacular. Hi, I'm Danielle, and you're watching Animal Logic. Chimeras, also known as ghost sharks, are the forgotten members of the cartilaginous fish class Chondrichthys. When people talk about these fish, they usually only talk about sharks, rays, and skates. And forgotten are these deep sea Frankensteins. The majority of Chimera live in the deep oceans around the world, thriving in depths beyond 200 meters. Some Chimera have been found living at 2,600 meters deep, though there are a few species, like the fantastically named Chimera monstrosa, that live in much shallower waters, around 50 meters deep. The Chimera's closest relatives are sharks, but they parted ways 400 million years ago, about 10 million years before our ancestors emerged from the water. And they haven't changed all that much since. Chimera are the most primitive known cartilaginous fish. While they still bear some resemblance to sharks, they can be easily told apart. One of their most prominent differences are their gills. Sharks can have up to seven gill slits, while Chimera only have one. And their gill slit is covered by a flap called an operculum, like bony fish. Also like sharks, Chimera don't have any bones in their body, and their skeleton is made of cartilage. Depending on the species, Chimera can measure up to 1.5 meters long. While they are hard to study due to their deep sea locale, they're estimated to live well over 20 years in the wild. To defend themselves, most Chimera come equipped with a venomous dorsal spine. This spine is located on their backs. It's a modified scale and it breaks off after every use. After which, the Chimera grows a replacement. This dorsal spine is very useful in defense and is incredibly painful to humans. Chimera venom can cause necrosis, hallucinations, localized paralysis, and a lot more. You do not want to mess with these ghosts. Chimera reach sexual maturity fairly late in life, and like sharks, male chimeras have external reproductive organs called claspers. They use these tubes to insert sperm into the body of the female. If successful, the female will lay large leathery eggs. Chimera have a particularly difficult time when targeted by fisheries or when caught as bycatch. Their bodies are so adapted to living at crushing depths that when they're hauled out, their bodies can't handle the change, and most don't survive the process. There are three families of Chimera. The first contains the plow-nosed Chimera, or elephant fish. They get their name from the fleshy appendage sticking out of their face. They can measure up to 125 centimeters long and use their plow to find bottom-dwelling prey, like sea urchins, mollusks, and crabs. Their plow is lined with electroreceptors, which help locate hidden prey by sensing their electric field. Every time a muscle moves, it creates an electric field. Even if their prey sits perfectly still, their hearts give them away. Then the chimera strikes, crushing their prey with their broad, flat teeth. While elephant fish may have the most specialized electroreceptors, all species of chimera have sensory organs used to detect electric fields to find prey. And the coolest thing? You can see them. If you look closely at this chimera's face, you'll see that it's lined with little dots. These are their electrosensory organs. Similar to frogfish, elephantfish have large pectoral fins that help them move along the ocean floor. The second family are the short-nosed chimera, or ratfish. Their snout is much shorter than their plow-nosed cousins, and they have a much longer and skinnier tail, hence their name. Finally, the long-nosed chimera. These fish have long paddle-shaped noses, 
and all eight living species are found in deep, open water. They're also known as spookfish, for obvious reasons. Also definitely reminds me of Zero from Nightmare Before Christmas. Anyone else getting that vibe? Lamprey are an order of about 40 species of ancient vertebrates called petromyzontiforms. 18 of those species are carnivorous, parasitic, and here to give you chupacabra vibes. Lamprey are sometimes inaccurately called lamprey eels because of their resemblance. While eels are elongated bony fish, lamprey skeletons are made out of cartilage, actually making them more similar to sharks than to eels. And even though they are slippery as eels, thanks to their lack of scales, eels, these vampire wannabes, are not. The Atlantic sea lamprey is one such carnivorous species and is an invasive one to boot. Great efforts are taken to eliminate it, but since the lamprey has stayed roughly the same for the past 340 million years and survived four major extinction events, this slippery fish is certainly in it to win it. 2021 marks the 100th anniversary of the Atlantic sea lamprey invading the upper North American Great Lakes. While Atlantic sea lamprey are native to Lake Ontario, the final lake in the chain of Great Lakes which serves as the outlet to the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence River, it wasn't until relatively recently that they gained access to the rest of the Great Lakes. Niagara Falls acted as a natural barrier, keeping the Atlantic sea lamprey from accessing lakes Erie, Huron, Michigan, and Superior. It wasn't until 1921 that they were first spotted in Lake Erie, two years after the man-made Welland Canal, which bypasses Niagara Falls, was deepened. By 1938, they were running loose in all the remaining Great Lakes, as well as many other connected bodies of water. To feed, the Atlantic sea lamprey and other carnivorous species suction themselves onto their victims with their sharp, horn-like teeth that encircle their jawless mouths. Once attached, they use their pointed tongues to bore through the fish's scales and flesh, a process that is terrifyingly called rasping. Once latched on, they suck the blood and other bodily fluids from their prey. Anticoagulant enzymes make sure that the helpless victim's blood doesn't clot and stop the suck fest. Creatures that drink blood are known as hematophagus. This includes creepy crawly pests like mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, bedbugs, and leeches, which also use anticoagulants to keep their prey's blood flowing. Ooh, oh, he's biting. I can feel his teeth digging into my elbow. Other hematophagous animals include the vampire bat, the red-tailed oxpecker, and the vampire finch. Check out our vampire episode after this if you're in the market for extra chills. In the larval stage of their lives, lamprey are known as ammocetes and are, by contrast, harmless as lambs. The five-inch long amocetes bury into the beds of streams and filter feed on algae and other microorganisms. They'll stay this way for about four years or even longer for non-carnivorous species. Then they turn into transformers. No, really, that's what the juveniles are called. They just look like smaller versions of their adult selves at this point. By the following summer, carnivorous lamprey transformers become full-blown adults. And that's when the feeding frenzy begins. Sea lampreys feed on all types of fish, including trout, salmon, whitefish, yellow perch, walleye, catfish, and sturgeon. In their OG ocean home, Atlantic sea lamprey do not typically kill the fish they feed on, thanks to coevolution. Without this coevolution in the Great Lakes, however, sea lampreys have a 40 to 60% kill rate. Each of these bloodsuckers can kill up to 40 pounds of fish during their 12 to 18 month feeding period. Then the adults spawn and die shortly after, leaving the next generation to pick up the torch of decimation. Controlling lamprey populations in the Great Lakes takes a serious team effort. 
The Great Lakes Fishery Commission, in cooperation with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, all work together to keep lamprey populations down. They do this in a few ways, by treating infected streams with lampricide, which kills the lamprey amicete while having little to no impact on other fish and wildlife, with barriers to block the paths of spawning adults and by tricking their keen senses of smell with pheromones to attract and trap them. This fish might seem like a horror movie monster, but it's worth repeating that not all lampreys are terrifying bloodsuckers with nightmare holes for mouths. The non-carnivorous species, for example, don't feed at all. Instead, they live on the reserves they've stockpiled during their larval phase, spawning and dying within six to 10 months of their transformation into adults. For millions of years in the Miocene, South America was a strange and dangerous place. It was a time when the continent was isolated and weird animals evolved to fill the ecological niches that dinosaurs used to occupy. The top predator placental mammals that rule today, like big cats and dogs, hadn't arrived yet. The land was dominated by carnivorous marsupials like the Thylacosmilus, crocodilian reptiles like the Purosaurus, one weird carnivorous armadillo, and of course, predatory birds. But we're not talking about eagles, hawks, or condors. This land was ruled by terrestrial birds, some of which were over two meters tall and had the biggest bird heads ever recorded. It's hard not to get a big head when you're the largest terror bird, but Kalenkin took it to the extreme. Just for context, the shoebill stork has one of the biggest heads among living birds. Their beak is about 25 centimeters long with sharp edges and a pointy tip. You do not want to have any part of you caught in its jaws. But the shoebill's beak, plus their entire body, which can be as tall as me, only adds up to about seven kilos in weight. The Kalenkin's head alone was heavier than a whole shoebill. Their skull was three times longer than a shoebill's, and their total body weight was 40 times more than a shoebill, measuring roughly 250 kilograms. Yes, these birds were as heavy as grizzly bears, except unlike bears, they hunted on two legs, so they were in many ways more similar to a theropod dinosaur like Velociraptor than to any living predator. Kalenkin was about three meters long from head to tail and roughly two meters tall. A single peck could probably split your head open, but we're not entirely sure if that's how they got their food. The most common theories are that they killed their prey by pecking it to death or by grabbing them and shaking to snap their neck. It's also possible that Kalenkin was a kleptoparasitic scavenger and mostly stole other predators' prey. That means these birds not only terrorized delicious prey animals, but also other ferocious predators as well. Nobody was safe from terror birds. Their fossils have been found in formations in Patagonia alongside extinct rodents like guillomies and sporacidonts, who are marsupial-like predators. They might have been both eaten by the Kalenkin and caught prey that the bird would later steal. Ground sloth babies were another likely prey of the terror bird. Yep, that's the saddest sentence I've ever said. Kalenkin was far from the only terror bird. One species was so successful that it was one of the few predators to colonize North America during the Great American Interchange. This was Titanus, a badass name for a badass predator who lived from about five to two million years ago. It was slightly shorter than Kalenkin and much leaner. It weighed roughly 150 kilograms, about the same as a jaguar or a small black bear. But as we know from those modern animals, that's plenty of weight to be a fearsome predator. So far, fossils of Titanus have only been found in Florida and Texas, and there's a huge geographical gap between them and their closest relatives in South America. 
That means that there were likely other terrorbird species that exploited the rainforest habitats of Central America. We just haven't found them yet. That might be an interesting project if you're an emerging paleontologist. We just ask that if you find a new species, you name it Animalogico. Terrorbirds emerged shortly after the extinction of their ancestors, the dinosaurs, around 62 million years ago, and were at the top of the food chain for almost 60 million years. Psilloteris, the youngest recorded species, lived until sometime between 80 and 6,000 years ago. Humans entered South America about 14,000 years ago. So if you're of South American descent, there's a decent chance your ancestors went head to head with a terror bird. I don't envy them. These birds could kill you before you even knew they were there. Terror birds were not only huge, they were also fast. Some species such as Mesembryornis milnidwardsi and Patagornis marshi could run upwards of 70 kilometers per hour. That's as fast as an ostrich. The difference is that ostriches evolved to run away from cheetahs, lions, and wild dogs, whereas terror birds could have hunted those big animals themselves. CT scans of terror bird skulls show that they were not likely to be huge biters. Their musculature wasn't meant to crush bone the way hyenas and crocodiles' jaws do. To take on larger prey, they probably used a combination of kicking, pecking, and possibly grabbing their prey with their massive beak and slamming it onto the ground. This is similar to how modern predatory birds, like secretary birds and roadrunners, kill their prey. Their feet were equipped with large claws that could tear open flesh and were longer than the famously lethal cassowary's claws. Though even without the claws, the sheer force of their kicks would have been enough to at least stun their prey. After that, depending on the prey, they would swallow it whole or shred it apart and eat the best pieces. Unfortunately, the changes in climate and the arrival of placental mammals like wolves and big cats were the doom of terror birds. Every empire crumbles eventually, and in this case, it was these furry animals that came to take the crown. But there's still a living relative of terror birds hiding in South America, biding its time, waiting for the right chance to make a power move. We have secured some footage, but viewer discretion is advised. This is the closest living relative of the Kalenkin, the Sariema. Okay, they're not as terrifying as their extinct cousins, but they do exhibit a lot of behaviors that are associated with terror birds. I'd love to talk more about them, but they deserve their own episode. We're still finding amazing fossils in South America. There are over 20 known species of terror birds and plenty more to be discovered. Stay tuned as we keep learning from these amazing beasts, although, Let's hope they don't come back to reclaim their crown. Bobbit worms are some of the most amazing, beautiful, and deadly bristle worms in the world. These danger noodles have been around for ages. The oldest bobbit worm dates back to 400 million years ago, and it was found in the Middle Devonian rocks of Ontario. Described in 2017, Websteroprion armstrongi was a jawsome beast that was about one meter long. These worms are ambush hunters, and from a distance, they look harmless. But if viable prey swims within range, the bobbit explodes out of its hole and catches it in the blink of an eye. Then the prey is dragged down into the depths of hell and never heard from again. The origin of their nickname might be an urban myth, but their mandible's cutting power is true. They're known to cut small fish in half and stun larger prey just long enough to pull them into their mucus-lined burrows. Bobbit worms are mostly nocturnal predators, so they need to be able to sense prey in the dead of night without using their eyes. To do that, they have five antennae coated with sensory organs that can detect chemicals and vibrations in the water. 
Once prey is detected, it's time to go on a chopping spree. When striking, a bobbit worm fires out of its hole at around six meters a second. Their mouth parts are hidden, but on their way up to their prey, they turn outwards like a finger in a glove. The mandible provides the cutting power, and the secondary serrated mouth parts, called maxillae, grasp the prey and bring it into the mouth. There are some claims that the mandible can inject a paralyzing toxin, but this hasn't been confirmed and research is ongoing. But their head is not the only interesting thing about bobbits. Their bodies can be beautifully iridescent, and they're super long. Bobbits are just about two and a half centimeters wide, but they can be up to three meters long. Their bodies are segmented, and each segment has bristles. As they grow, they add segments to their body. The current record holder for most segments was a Japanese bobbit with an amazing 673. Having all those segments can be helpful for two reasons. One, they can be ejected in case they get caught by a predator, and two, detached segments might still work as sexual organs. Bobbit worms have been observed breaking themselves into two or more parts when handled. Amazingly, sometimes more than one part can survive and regrow the missing parts. So, by splitting themselves, you get two short, genetically identical bobbit worms instead of a single long individual. The sexual aspect of their segment detachment hasn't been confirmed. Nobody knows quite how bobbit worms mate but their closest relatives are all broadcast spawners. That means that the females eject unfertilized eggs and the males fertilize them. On some bristle worm species, possibly including the bobbit worm, as the animal becomes sexually mature, it grows gonads in its lower segments. When it's time to spawn, the lower segments separate and float towards the surface to meet other lower segments. It's like a blind date for severed genitals. If you find this cornucopia of adaptations a bit too much, you don't have to worry about encountering these long boys. Most bobbits live on the ocean floor at depths of between 10 and 40 meters, so you're unlikely to meet one of them at the beach. But if you have a saltwater aquarium, you might accidentally bring a bobbit worm into your house. Bobbit worms sometimes hitch rides in ocean rocks or water used to fill saltwater aquaria. When they're young, they can survive eating coral or other organic matter. But when they get big, they start going for the fish. Something like this happened at the New Key Blue Reef Aquarium in England. The aquarium staff started finding mutilated dead fish in the morning. So, they set traps overnight, but they would come back to find that these traps were destroyed. Uh, oh. See those legs? It's like a horror movie. I don't know how to see this guy without pissing him off. This led to a complete draining of the aquarium. After doing that, they found a 1.2 meter long bobbit worm, which they named Barry. Oh my god, dude, I'm freaking out. That's some tremor shit. Anybody see that movie? By then, he had killed several fish, but was the most popular animal in the aquarium. So he was moved to his own enclosure and lived peacefully ever after. And this is our famous bobbit worm underwater sand waterfall amazing tank. Um, the bobbit worm is over here. This is a very deep sand bed and he never seems to go below two inches of the sand, but we gave it to him anyway. I think he likes the waterfall. The view is too nice up top. Atropa belladonna is a cute Eurasian cherry producing plant with a terrible reputation. Just to give you an idea, in addition to its common name, the deadly nightshade, it's also been called the death cherry, the devil's berry, and the beautiful death. And to be fair, it's fully deserved. This plant is insanely toxic. It contains tropane alkaloids to defend itself from insects that try to eat it. But in vertebrates, those alkaloids affect the smooth muscles of the body, 
including the urinary and GI tracts and sweat glands. In some cases, it can cause extreme dry mouth, hallucinations, delirium, and even death. And of course, people have weaponized it. In the year 1030, Macbeth and Duncan I of Scotland used deadly nightshade tea to poison the invading English troops of Harold Harefoot, killing many of them and forcing the rest to retreat. Emperor Augustus of Rome is rumored to have been poisoned by his wife Livia using this plant. She wanted to make sure her kid inherited the throne. Spicy. This plant is native to Eurasia, but it's spread to Africa and North America, so there's a good chance there's a few near you. Here's how to identify it so you can steer clear of it. They're a little over a meter tall, with small bell-shaped flowers and long leaves, which can be about 15 centimeters long. The berries are small and circular, and both the berries and the flowers start off green. But as they mature and become more toxic, they turn purple. I'm serious. Stay away from this plant. Just two berries are enough to kill a child. The roots are the most toxic part of the deadly nightshade. But a single leaf has enough poisonous alkaloids to kill an adult. The berries are slightly sweet, but if you eat more than a handful, you're in trouble. Some animals, like rabbits, sheep, and cows, seem to be resistant to its effects. Bees readily consume its nectar and sometimes end up making slightly toxic honey. Dogs, unfortunately, are not that lucky. So make sure to keep your pooch away from these killer plants. But of course, industrious people have learned to use it in small doses for reasons other than regicide. In the Mediterranean, for example, it's been used as a cosmetic. The scientific name, belladonna, means beautiful woman. Up until the Middle Ages, some women would make a sort of diluted tea and use it as eye drops. The alkaloids would affect the normal functioning of the smooth muscles of the eye and would cause pupils to dilate, giving them a unique look. Cleopatra apparently used it regularly, though the product was known to cause long-term damage to vision. People were really into dilated pupils in those days. Deadly nightshade and some of its toxic relatives have been proposed as medicine for a number of health issues, although there's very little evidence that they work at all. Chronic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, and hemorrhoids are just some of the ailments it's been used to treat. Unfortunately, as far as we know, most of the positive effects have most likely been cases of the placebo effect. But with the right dosage, it's been shown to improve mood, libido, and cause hallucinations. So, in other words, it's been used recreationally. In the Middle Ages, the church used to carry out witch hunts, which often targeted drug addicts. Deadly nightshade was a relatively common ingredient of witch's brew and caused its users to behave strangely, to hallucinate, and give them the feeling of being able to fly. Of course, there were other compounds in their brews. Medieval surgeons used it too, as an anesthetic, but it often caused patients to behave erratically and have vivid dreams. As religious persecution ramped up, its use was discontinued, as surgeons were afraid of being labeled as sorcerers. So that's the story of a plant that started out by making compounds to fight off bugs and ended up as a favorite of kings, queens, and witches. You might be curious to see this one out in the wild, but just make sure you don't touch it. Oh, they are so tasty. Mm. A healthy mountain treat. Six hours later, mm. we're both like... Probably just like <laughs> from both ends. I mean, I hope they're blackberries. We're going to find out. Because I just ate like two handfuls. Marabou storks are a large wading bird species in the stork family. The name marabou comes from an Arabic word that roughly translates to quiet or hermit-like. That might have something to do with the fact that the marabou stork does not have a voice box, so it can't sing like many other birds. However, they can make sounds by clapping their bills together or croaking through their throat pouch.
Marabou storks are native to Africa and can be found in the wilds of Senegal, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Namibia, South Africa, and Uganda, where it reigns as the unofficial national bird. They're comfortable in wetlands, semi-arid savannas, and grasslands. And because they're not too shy around humans, you can also find them in fishing villages or garbage dumps. The marabou storks have been very rudely called the ugliest animal on the planet, to which I say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The stork has been nicknamed the undertaker bird because when seen from behind, its back and wings look like a long black cloak. It's also massive, which adds to the grim reaper effect. They're about five feet tall, weigh 20 pounds, and boast a wingspan that can stretch three meters. That is the largest wingspan after the albatross and the great white pelican. It has a large bill, a sunburnt looking bald pink head, a white ruff, and soft white tail feathers, known as marabou. Marabou was actually an extremely popular feather trim in women's fashion. Even Marilyn Monroe wore them. The marabou stork's legs are skinny and white, and the white comes from, ugh, its own poop. That's right, it poops on its legs to cool down in the sun and protect itself from sunburns. Hmm, I wonder if Marilyn knew where her feathers had been. <gasps> their leg bones and toe bones are hollow, which helps them balance their weight and take off to fly. I guess we should also mention that puffy reddish thing on the stork's neck. It's an inflatable guler sack used in courtship rituals. It's also the pouch it can croak from. But let's move on from the marabou stork's unique physical appeal and focus on its personality. While they may look like creepy goth loners, the storks are actually pretty social. They're often seen in groups and gather close together to roost at night. Marabou storks have a reputation for being lazy, standing around, sitting in trees, doing a whole lot of nothing. But this way of life helps them avoid expending energy unnecessarily. So the next time someone calls you lazy and tries to get you off the couch, tell them you're doing very important marabou stork research. Like other storks, it flies with its legs flowing out from behind its body. When in flight, it tugs its neck to form a flattened S, which helps the weight of its beak to rest on its shoulders. The marabou stork soars high up in the sky in the search for food. It's mainly a scavenger with an appetite for carrion. Like vultures, the storks will appear any time an animal is killed, in the hopes of snagging a scrap. But it will eat almost any animal, dead or alive. Fish, frogs, lizards, insects, snakes, rats, flamingos, crocodile eggs, even young crocodiles. They're also drawn to grass fires. The storks will fly ahead of the flames and swoop down to pick up small animals running away from the blaze. Oh my gosh, can these birds get any scarier? How about if we add killer bees? Just kidding. They're regular everyday bees, and they follow the stork around in the hopes that the stork will pull apart the dead carcasses of animals, and the bee can eat what's left over and use the remains as shelter to lay their eggs. It's an animal relationship called commensalism, and it's really only beneficial for the bees, but marabou storks don't seem to mind. Storks breed in the dry season when water levels are low. That means fish and birds are easier to find and catch. During breeding season, they'll gather in groups ranging anywhere from 20 pairs to several thousand. A male stakes out his territory and inflates his throat pouch when newcomers arrive. When females enter his territory, they pair up and nest building begins. Couples tend to mate for life and construct their nests in trees, on the tops of buildings, and on the sides of cliffs. Two to three eggs are laid, and after a month of mom and dad taking turns to incubate the eggs, they hatch. When they're born, the marabou is covered in a gray down. They won't reach full maturity until about four years old. Young marabou are browner with smaller beaks. As they get older, they'll reach their Freddy Krueger phase, and many will eventually get age spots. Marabou storks live about 25 years in the wild and 40 years in captivity. Don't worry about their numbers. They're classified as a species of least concern, which means that they're gonna stick around forever, waiting watching 
for death, for fire, for food. Sleep tight. Most insects have natural enemies, parasites and predators. The larvae of a tiny wasp has destroyed the internal organs of this aphid. Parasitic zombification. This horror of evolution is exhibited by multiple species separated by thousands of years on the evolutionary tree. The larvae of such parasites grow up inside the bodies of their hosts and emerge to pupate and start a new life cycle. From fungi that turns ants suicidal, to chest-bursting wasps, to worms that feast on the insides of crickets, science fiction really takes its cues from nature. The wave of murder is being committed by creatures who feast upon the flesh of their victims. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened and almost incoherent. Parasite host relationships are in an ongoing battle of evolution. The two are continually adapting to try to find advantage over each other. None are more fascinating than the behavior altering parasites, the parasites that turn their hosts into husks of their former selves, with all free will removed. Zombies. Zombies. The living dead. Ophiocordyceps are a genus of fungi found primarily in tropical rainforests. Like many fungi, they need to spread their spores through the air to reproduce. But when living in a relatively windless rainforest, this can be difficult. But the Ophiocordyceps have found a solution. A fascinating and horrifying solution. Ants. Ants are mostly a nuisance. New poisons are developed to rid us of insect pests. The cordyceps will release a burst of spores as an ant passes by. If one of these spores lands on the ant, it can penetrate the ant's exoskeleton. The skeleton of an insect is outside its body and is called an exoskeleton. Once inside, the fungus grows rapidly, feasting on the ant's internal organs, and within three and a half weeks, half of the ant's body weight is the fungus. The cordyceps severs the ant's nerves, cutting communication between its brain and muscles, it's now controlled entirely by the cordyceps. Yet despite this internal carnage, the ant still shows no symptoms. When the cordyceps have fully grown, it will guide the ant out of the colony, always when the sun is highest in the sky at noon, and lead it up a leaf that is 25 centimeters off the ground. The cordyceps are always sure to guide the ant to a leaf that is in their temperature sweet spot, between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, and a humidity of 95%. This is the ideal temperature for the cordyceps to thrive. The leaf will also be close to an ant trail, making it easier for its spores to find a new host. Then, the cordyceps will have the ant bite the underside of the leaf, holding it in a death grip that the ant is unable to open. Now, with the hook in deep, he twists it to make sure the victim will never get away. Now, the cordyceps finishes the job. It devours the ant's brain, and over the next three weeks, it bursts out of the ant's head, forming a tall stalk. When grown, the stalk will begin to release spores along the nearby ant trail, claiming fresh victims. These parasites can devastate ant colonies, but ants have adapted. When they find a fallen ant, they carry its body far away from the colony in case it's been taken over by cordyceps. This is why it's so crucial for the fungus to force their host to look as normal as possible and thus skirt detection. All law enforcement agencies and the military have been organized to search out and destroy the marauding ghouls. This battle between ant and fungus has been happening for at least 48 million years. Scientists have found leaves of that age that have the trademark dumbbell-shaped death bite of the zombie ant. Yet despite their sinister reproductive strategy, cordyceps also find themselves a victim to parasites. And parasites that attack harmful insects 
are also helpful to man. These parasites within a parasite are called hyperparasites. The one that the cordyceps are host to remains unknown. But they make it so that only 6.5% of all cordyceps can produce spores. Without these hyperparasites, ants would be in for a world of hurt. Cordyceps do target other species, but ants are the most effective due to their eusocial nature. Some ants find themselves victim to another type of parasite, the lancet liver fluke. These flatworms have a much more complex life cycle than cordyceps and begin their journey in the humblest of places, sheep poo. And what loves eating sheep poo? As it turns out, snails do. The fluke enters the snail, which shortly after releases it in little slime balls, an often favorite treat of some ants. Once eaten by the ant, the fluke will travel up to its cerebral ganglia. There, it releases a chemical that forces the ant to leave the colony at night, climb up a blade of grass, and wait to get eaten by a sheep. If the ant is so unlucky as to not be eaten, the fluke will have it return to the colony and pretend to be normal for another day, until it forces it to go out again. When it's eaten, the fluke will work its way into the sheep's liver, where it will lay its eggs to be excreted by the sheep, starting the whole process again. Other flukes follow similar life cycles, but instead of controlling ants to reproduce in sheep, they control fish to reproduce in birds. They infest the fish and then force it to constantly jump out of the water, making it an appealing snack to a passing gull. Lesson learned, don't trust a meal that looks like it wants to be eaten. Fortunately, the parasites found in water get a whole lot worse than flukes. The larvae of the aptly named kamikaze horsehair worm is born in water, where it is unknowingly gobbled up by other larval insects, like mosquito larvae. The mouth parts are seen to be in constant motion when feeding at the water surface. Suddenly, the skin bursts along the middle of the back, literally oozing out of the pupil envelope. When the infested mosquitoes eventually exit the water, they'll be eaten by crickets. Here, the horsehair worm will grow, sustaining itself by eating the cricket's insides. When it's fully grown and ready to mate, the worm begins to control the cricket's movements, forcing them to jump into the water and kill themselves. Multiple larvae can infest a cricket, leading to dozens of horsehair worms bursting from a single cricket. Once in the water, the horsehair worms will find a mate reproduce, and restart the cycle. Green crabs fall victim to a similarly grim fate. The horrifically named castrator barnacle will make its way through a crab's joint into its exoskeleton. The barnacle will find its way to the rear of the crab where their eggs are incubated and emerge from the crab as a sac. From this point on, the barnacle begins to change everything inside the crab's body. If the crab is female, it destroys its reproductive organs. And if it's a male, the barnacle starts to change the shape of the male to resemble a female. These body snatchers force the crabs to care for and lay their eggs as if they were their own. These parasites stay with the crab and use it to reproduce and guard its young until the crab dies. This hornworm, covered with small silk cocoons, is doomed to die. A parasitic wasp laid its eggs within the hornworm's body. Dinocampus coccinelli wasps employ a similar strategy. They hunt ladybugs, and when they find one, they inject their egg into it. After 20 days, the egg emerges from the ladybug and forms a cocoon between the ladybug's legs. Zombified by a virus transmitted by the egg, the ladybug will defend the cocoon at all costs, which drastically increases its survival rate. Fortunately, this story has a happy ending. Well, more so than the others. About 25% of ladybugs recover from the zombification after the wasp has left the cocoon. But king of zombies, the ladybug killer is not. That title goes to the emerald jewel wasp. These wasps zombify cockroaches, usually about twice their size. When they find one, they sting it two times. The first sting temporarily paralyzes them. 
This second sting is much more precise. They surgically target the part of the cockroach's brain that controls dopamine output, stopping it, and taking away all free will of movement from the cockroach. Cockroach spreads disease as well as ruining food. This is an enemy of man. The wasp will eat one of the roach's antenna and use the other like a leash to walk the cockroach to its grave. Once in the hole, the wasp will lay her egg on the roach and block the entrance on her way out to protect her egg from predators. Three days later, the egg will hatch and the larvae will burrow into the still living, still zombified cockroach. The larvae will feast on the insides of the cockroach before forming a cocoon. There, it will stay in the now dead roach until it finishes its metamorphosis, at which point it will burst out of the cockroach. Black widows are a type of spider perhaps best known for, well, you know, sexual cannibalism. That memorable behavior is where the black widow got its name. But you might be surprised to learn that the rumors of their treachery are greatly exaggerated. There are over 30 species of black widow, Scarjo notwithstanding. But only a few of those choose to make their lovers a post-coital snack. So let's not stereotype these venomous vixens. Some black widows sport the iconic all-black body and the red hourglass-shaped markings on their abdomen. But most species actually come in a wide variety of colors, from brown to red to completely black. Their life expectancy also depends on their species. Females generally live a lot longer and are much, much larger than the males. Black widows have been around for about a hundred million years and can be found all over the world. They like warm, dry climates and prefer to spin their webs in dark, sheltered spots close to the ground. They feed on flies, mosquitoes, beetles, caterpillars, worms, grasshoppers, and hydra. You know, typical spider food. When the black widow catches their prey, they wrap more silk around them and paralyze them with venom. Their venom is 15 times more toxic than a rattlesnake's. Not exactly a peaceful death. Black widows use their sense of smell for a lot of the same things we do. Avoiding predators, tracking down food, and finding shelter. But chemoreception is far more important for them. It's actually their main means of communication. The chemicals used to communicate are called pheromones. Most people associate the word with scents that make you attractive, but in the animal kingdom, they play a much larger role. Pheromones have been used since some of the very first animals, and possibly by other life forms before them. When it's time to mate, the female black widow releases pheromone-laced silk onto her web. Those pheromones evaporate into the air and float far and wide, acting as a siren song to attract potential mates. Come to my web! You cannot resist me! <laughs> Thank you, that is my impression of Lolf, Queen of Spiders. The pheromone signal becomes strong, thanks to a process called sender-receiver coevolution. The females who send the most attractive chemicals are the most likely to pass their genes on to the next generation. Enter the male widow. Like the females, this little guy has inherited quite the impressive genes from his four spiders. The ability to detect female pheromones in an ocean of chemicals. It's thanks to evolution that these two have mastered the science of sexual communication. It's time for this male to show off just how good he is at picking up on sexy signals. If he's actively searching for a mate, he'll crawl up to a high place and wave his arms around a bunch. And then he'll smell them to see if he's caught any pheromones. Very subtle stuff. 
When he gets a hit, this spider heads straight to his potential partner, like a moth to a flame, or, you know, like a male spider to a black widow's web. Some of you may be thinking, oh no, this poor little Spider-Man, he has no clue he's about to become brunch. But remember, only a few species are sexual cannibals. And for those femme fatales famous for feeding on males, well, it's only if they're in the mood for a snack. If the male is smart, he'll mate with her after she's eaten. How does he know if she's full? Chemo reception. If his sense of smell tells him that she's starving, he instinctively knows not to get any closer. The female's web is covered in pheromonal discharge. Now we get to see how those pheromones work via direct contact. When the male touches the web, he's sort of tasting the female's pheromones and gets kicked into romance mode. The chemicals trigger his courting behavior. This doesn't mean wine, roses, and back rubs. Nope. Black widows opt for vibrations. The female black widow doesn't even care that her mate seems weak and tiny. She's more concerned about his moves. And although her pheromones may have communicated she was looking for a mate, she may not be entirely sold on this male. Get off. Then, his plan hits a snag. Another, bigger male, who's also been attracted by the female's pheromones, wants to shoot his shot. And he's not wasting any time. He immediately mounts the female Black Widow. And it's on! The two spiders battle it out for the female's attention. Who will win? Even though the smaller male put in all the hard work to court the female, the new guy has the edge because of his size. Please, take it somewhere else, boys. As usual, the bigger male wins out. Now to enjoy his success. He tries his luck at inserting his two palps, the sexual organs around his fangs that look like black balls, into the female's epiginum, the genital opening on her abdomen. Success! As soon as the palp goes inside the female, it curls up like a spring, and then he gives her his sperm. Aw, how sweet. Mating can last up to 20 minutes. Right about now, those hypnotic pheromones start to wear off. Will the male end up in the mouth of his mate? Or is this his lucky day? Whew. He walks away unscathed. He managed to survive a tango with the iconic Black Widow. What a badge of honor. Once the male leaves, the female can now lay her eggs in a gorgeous silky egg sac. These sacs can hold up to 300 eggs, and the sperm her male partner gave her can produce up to 10 viable egg sacs, which means this one tryst could result in 3,000 new baby spiders. Bye-bye bikinis. All in all, a highly productive day for black widows. Well done, you two. A credit to your species. The erect, three centimeter wide green stems of the carrion plant make it the perfect cactus dupe. But this stinky Stanley is actually a succulent, which are defined by thick and fleshy tissue that is specialized for storing water. Cacti are a subgroup of succulents, so while all cacti are succulents, not all succulents are cacti. In the case of the carrion plant, this succulent is actually a member of Opossinaceae, the same family as milkweed. Other less cadaverous names for the carrion plant include giant toad flower, Zulu giant, and starfish flower. But if you want to find out how this succulent ended up with a name like carrion plant, just follow your nose. Carrion plant flowers emit a rotting flesh stench that is unmistakably stomach churning and definitely deserving of the moniker. This clustering succulent forms clumps that can sometimes reach one to two meters across. It's the most widely north-south distributed of the roundabout 29 species of Stapelia and can be found all over Southern Africa. Thanks to its unique characteristics, 
It can also be found as an ornamental on the shelves of the world's bravest and possibly most nose-blind succulent collectors. Jokes aside, there's a good reason for all the stink. The scent attracts all manner of death-loving carrion flies who are fooled into fertilizing the plant. Pollination by carrion flies even has a specific name, Sapromyophily. Rafflesia and the corpse flower, which we've already covered on our channel, are two other examples of plants that use this sneaky scent scam for pollination purposes. Unlike in the human world, there are certain advantages for plants that have major BO. Carrion flies, for example, are present year-round, so they can pollinate year-round as well. In the case of the carrion plant, their blooms unleash their stink onto the world and are ready for pollination in the fall, when shorter daylight hours trigger the blossoms to open. But why do flowers produce scent at all? Flowers are basically multi-sensory billboards for passing pollinators. The objective for the plant is to get the pollinators, which could be bees, flies, wasps, ants, butterflies, moths, or even hummingbirds and bats, to touch their reproductive structures. The pollinator, in turn, gets a yummy snack out of the deal in the form of pollen, nectar, or oils. It's a real you scratch my statement, I'll scratch yours situation. But in the case of carrion plants, this relationship between fly and flower is actually one-sided because the fly gets no reward whatsoever for paying a visit. Instead of offering a sweet snack, the carrion plant is an expert at what's called brood site mimicry. The flies see and smell the flower, and thinking they found a heap of rotting, stinking flesh, they oviposit. Or in layflies' terms, they lay their eggs. In the process of ovipositing, the flies will inadvertently touch the reproductive parts of the carrion plant, which is just what the carrion plant was hoping for. And this one-sided relationship only gets more toxic after the flies have left their eggs behind. Unlike actual rotting meat, the flower lacks the protein that the larvae need to survive, so they will inevitably die. One study even suggested investigating the carrion plant as a potential tool in fly control for this very reason. The carrion plant takes being a multi-sensory advertisement to the extreme, with not only its pungent perfume, but also its looks. It looks like a large fleshy starfish baking in the sun. And it kind of smells like one too. Its flower is one of the largest in the world, with these star-shaped blooms reaching up to 40 centimeters wide. They can vary in color from cream to pale yellow and are covered in red or pink zebra stripes and fringes of hair. Everything about the size, shape, color, and scent of this plant screams hairy rotten carrion. A blowfly's dream come true. While the flies might be loving it, the same can't be said for people in certain regions around the world where the carrion plant is being investigated for its invasive potential. In Pakistan, Honduras, Australia, Hawaii, and Venezuela, for example, it's already escaped cultivation. Like milkweed, carrion plants produce seed pods, and the seeds themselves are adapted to wind dispersal, with each individual sporting a tiny parachute. In one square meter of carrion plant, there can be up to 1,500 seeds, and with a 62% germination rate, these plants are more than ready to Mary Poppins down into new areas and start stinking up the joint. The carrion plant was used by various cultures in Southern Africa as a medicinal plant to treat everything from hysteria to pain and to induce vomiting. Currently, it's being pharmaceutically investigated as a potential appetite suppressant. And I think it's working because just talking about the stinker is making me wish I skipped brunch. Despite their stink, carrion plants are grown ornamentally by strong-stomached enthusiasts. They're relatively easy to propagate from stem cuttings or seeds. Like most succulents, it's important not to overwater these demogorgon-looking plants. Just like me, carrion plants cannot tolerate temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius. So just make sure to keep it toasty. And as long as you treat your carrion plant well, it's very likely to flower. In case you want your place to smell like rotting, stinking flesh, this is the plant for you. <laughs> Hematophagy, the practice of drinking blood from another animal. Speculation continues as to who will be the next victim. These predators are vampires. 300 million years before man appeared on Earth. With time to develop varieties so diverse, their numbers are beyond conception. For much of the odds, vampires dominated our cultural landscape. Yet for all their sparkling, headboard-shattering, sleep-stalking charm, they couldn't be further removed from their inspiration in the natural world. There are over 15,000 species that drink blood. Some species drink blood in order to survive or reproduce. These animals are exclusively hematophagous. Others do it as a secondary source of nutrition. 
they practice hematophagy opportunistically. The earliest known vampires are proto-mosquitoes, and they lived about 220 million years ago. Yet not all bloodsuckers trace their roots back to these mosquitoes. Vampirism has evolved separately at least six times in invertebrates. Bloodsucking isn't as straightforward as it seems, and it requires specialized adaptations for the evolutionary strategy to succeed. The first step is finding a host big enough to feed on, and then figuring out how to attach yourself to said host. Oh, good, it's going in deeper. I can feel it piercing more. While the method of many of our fictional vampires requires that slow, spooky stalking to find a host, for many vampiric insects, it is not so easy. Many of these blood-sucking insects don't even have wings and have to rely on their hosts and environments for dispersal. Ticks, for example, wait on blades of grass for a host to walk by close enough so that they can attach themselves. Man's ancient enemy continues to multiply. This tick alone, in a few generations, can give birth to young, outnumbering the population of China. Batflies also lack wings, and many species have evolved to be hyper-specialized to bats. They're hard and flat, and their legs are covered in little hairs, all of which make it very difficult for the bats to dislodge or kill them. They're born, raised, and die, all on bats. Imagine having a tick on your face for your entire life. Along with ticks and mites, 10,000 species are man's mortal foe. Insect carriers bring death and disease to man himself. Insects that are able to hunt prey, like mosquitoes, rely on vision, temperature cues, and chemoreception. Tracking CO2 emissions is the most common way these vampires find their meals. Like my dear old gran used to say, if it breathes, it bleeds. Once they've found prey, they need to not get killed. This can be tricky, as the prey of a vampire is often thousands of times larger than themselves. Many insects, like mosquitoes and leeches, inject analgesics to prevent the host from feeling the bite until after they've finished drinking. Blood makes a particularly appealing meal because it contains a lot of nutrients, specifically iron, salt, protein, and fat, but it also contains a lot of water. This can make the vampires heavy after feeding, increasing their chances of being preyed upon. Mosquitoes are able to filter out the nutrients from the blood and expel the water, but not all vampires are so adept. A male mosquito cannot bite or suck blood. A newly emerged male may try blood suction without success. Drinking blood as a primary source of nutrients is difficult, as it contains almost no vitamin C, and so vampiric species either need to adapt to produce their own vitamin C, or be able to get by with much less of it. Mosquitoes are quite possibly the most hated insect on the face of the earth, and that title is very well deserved. They spread horrific diseases around the world, and they ruin the outside. So perhaps it will give you a sense of poetic justice that mosquitoes, too, fall victim to bloodsuckers. Mosquitoes are targeted by little midges that drink their blood by puncturing their abdomens with their proboscis. Their mouth parts attach very securely to the mosquito and will stay attached for up to 56 hours through flight and all. If that's not justice, I don't know what is. The spider spinning his web for the unwary fly. The blood is the light, Mr. Redfield. Ivarka kulikavora, a jumping spider from Kenya, also targets mosquitoes for their blood. These spiders go after mosquitoes that are full of blood, in part for their nutrition, but also for mating. Jumping spiders that eat full mosquitoes have been found to be more attractive to the opposite sex. In a feeding frenzy, one jumping spider can kill up to 20 mosquitoes in rapid succession. They kill more than they can eat. These jumping spiders are true heroes. 
challenging mosquitoes for the title of the worst are kissing bugs and bed bugs. There's a little, little bug hiding right in there. Bed bugs are particularly awful as they seem to have adapted to feed specifically on humans. These bloodsuckers are particularly difficult to fight because the symptoms of their bites don't show up until several days after they've bitten you, giving them plenty of time to hide. This is compounded by the fact that bed bugs only need to feed about once a week. Like mosquitoes, they inject their prey with anticoagulants and painkillers before biting to prevent their prey from noticing. So this client tells me she noticed this two weeks ago. Well, she may have noticed them two weeks ago, but she's had them a lot longer than two weeks. See, like they're just friggin' everywhere. Kissing bugs or vampire bugs are obligate bloodsuckers that are equipped with a huge proboscis to drink blood. They get their name from their nasty habit of biting human faces, as they're highly attracted to the carbon dioxide that we exhale. Vampire moths have adapted their proboscis to drink blood. Lata is feeding on me. It's in? Is it? Ah! Is it hurting? Yeah. Sorry. The same mouth parts that are used for sucking up fruit juice are used to suck blood from large, tough-skinned mammals like buffalo. Only the males drink blood, and their bites are much more painful and leave a much bigger mark than mosquito bites. Oh, damn. Okay. Oh, that proboscis is full of blood. Good. It's pink. Yay. Yeah. I'm so glad. Anything coming out of the abdomen? No, nothing. But the okay. proboscis is pink with blood. That's really good. Yep. Much more frightening than vampiric moths, however, is the mouth of horrors, the lamprey. 18 species of lamprey drink fish blood, and while they may look like eels, they are actually jawless fish. They attach themselves to their prey using their rows of sharp, horrific teeth, gorging themselves for several days. In order to feed, once attached, they use their hard and sharp tongue to puncture a hole in the fish's body. The fish don't usually die from the wound, but they can develop infections. For a century, lampreys bred undisturbed in the lakes. No one suspected their potential danger. Then, in the 40s, their population exploded. 400 million years of evolution had done their job well. Sea lampreys have become a huge problem in the Great Lakes in North America. They've invaded the lakes through man-made canals and have since caused a steep decline in lake trout and other fish populations. All of the vampires that we've discussed today are bloodsuckers, but the ultimate vampire doesn't suck blood, it drinks it. Meet the vampire bat. There are three species of vampire bat, and they all use a very different strategy from other vampires. Instead of sucking blood, vampire bats cut the skin of their victims with their sharp teeth and wait for the blood to pour out and pool. Once there's enough, the bats lap it up. As I mentioned earlier, vampire bats themselves fall victim to the vampiric bat flies, and one study found that a single bat can be covered in up to 60 bat flies. And finally, the vampire finch. These harmless-looking birds are native to Wolf Island in the Galapagos, and they supplement their diet of seeds and nectar with blood from the blue-footed booby. Like vampire bats, they make a small incision in the skin of their host, and then they go to town on the blood. Nothing can stop it now. My dear Anton, this is power. <laughs>